Uh, we are in a sermon series called Consider Jesus. Now, I always have to give this prerequisite because I am from up north and I have a tendency to talk fast. Okay, yeah, so that, that's right. So with that, if I start talking fast, I'm going to look for a key people to say, you know, settle down, Gerald, settle down. I want to let you know. Down. Settle down, all right? But I get excited. So let's start out with this. Our key verse that we've been working from is Hebrews chapter 12, verses 1 through 3. And I'm going to read out of the Living Bible. Since we have such a huge crowd of men of faith watching us from the grandstands, let us strip off everything that slows us down or holds us back, and especially those sins that wrap themselves so tightly around our feet and trip us up. And let us run with patience the particular race that God has set before us. Keep your eyes on Jesus, our leader and instructor. He was willing to die a shameful death on the cross because of the joy he knew he would, ha uh, would be his afterwards. And now he sits in the place of honor by the throne of God. If you want to keep from becoming faint-hearted and weary, think about his patience as sinful men did such terrible things to him. Keep your eyes on Jesus. In high school, I used to pole vault. And uh, in pole vault, yeah, you find that funny. Okay, so in pole vaulting, you have this runway you have to run down, okay? And the whole goal is to get over the bar. All right, I'm going to call it an obstacle. The whole goal is to get over the obstacle, the bar that you're going towards. Now, the thing is, you have to go towards that goal, and you have to get over it. Now, if I were to pole vault and look at the bar, I would never get over it. You cannot look at the obstacle because you're not going to be able to get over it. So while I'm running, okay, I am holding a pole in my hand. And in that pole, I'm going to call that pole the Word of God. And you've got to hold tight to that pole because if you don't hold tight to that pole, when you put the pole down, your hand's going to slip. Okay? And you're not going to get over the obstacle. So you've got to hold tight to the pole. Once again, the pole is? There you go. But even with that, as you're running, there's what you call the plant box. Okay, the pole must be put into the plant box. I'm going to call the plant box your faith in Jesus. Nothing else matters. If I don't put the pole into the plant box, I'm not going to make it over the pole. So as I'm running towards where I'm going to, my eyes are only focused on one thing and one thing only, and that is the plant box. My, my eyes have to be focused on my faith in Jesus, so that when my faith in Jesus connects with the Word of God, it automatically propels me and projects me over my obstacles. Yeah. Does everyone understand that? Yeah. This is what happens. Now, if I were to take my eyes, if I hold, if I were to take my eyes off the plant box, I could still have the Word of God, but if I had nowhere to plant it, I'm not going anywhere. Okay? So it's very important that you Hold on to the pole, which is the word of God. Stay focused on Jesus, which is the plant box. And you still must run towards where you're going so you can be propelled over your obstacles. If I were to title this message today, I'm going to title it, What Are You Looking At? Okay? Father of God, in the name of Jesus, right now we pray that you prepare our hearts to receive the word that you have for us today, Lord God. I pray, Lord God, that it'll be none of me and all of you. Let your word rain forth strong today, Father. Let it plant a seed into the heart. Let it, let it be a, a, a nourishment to those that already have the seed planted. But Lord God, I pray that when we leave here today, we do not leave the same and we're ready to receive. We bind any distraction from our hearts, from our minds, from our eyes, so we can hear and stay tuned to you. In Jesus' name, amen. Have you guys ever seen, back in the day, there was a, a, a craze called uh, the magic eye. You remember those photos where, where you have a whole bunch of crazy confusion going on behind you? And it's like a whole bunch of bright colors and squiggly lines and dots. I don't know if we have one. There we go. We got one up there, right? So you got to look at those things, right? And if you focus just right, you can see an image inside that chaos, right? So... Back in the day, we used to get the paper, and we used to hold the paper like this, or hold it like this, or tilt our head sideways, move it closer, move it back. You would squint, 
you would close your eyes real tight and then open them and hopefully you can see a revelation. There's a whole bunch of different things you would adjust so that you're in the midst of all this organized chaos and confusion, you'll be able to see the image that's inside of it. By the way, does anyone see the image yet? No. Okay, <laughs> that's all right, all right? Then you got, we're gonna come back to that one. Then you got the other pictures, right? Where, where all of a sudden, if you look at this image, you might see a woman's face, okay? Where other of you, others of you might see a man playing a saxophone, okay? Depending on what perception you have, you might see one or the other. Some of us are blessed to see both. And then no matter what happens, it all depends on where you are, what perception you have, what part of the brain you're thinking of, and what you're focusing on. But then, like in the other picture, sometimes there's so much chaos, so much confusion, so much stuff going on, no matter what you do to focus, you still can't see the image inside the picture. Maybe it's because, well actually, let's say this. This is more like our faith, if you think about it, right? We're walking out our faith, and then we have financial problems that come our way. We have health issues that are happening. We have parents that are sick. We have kids that are sick. We have family issues, kid issues, sports going on. We have a whole bunch of other things going on. So now we're no longer focused on the, the image that's in there, but all the confusion and chaos that's around us. So what happens is we're usually looking at the situation that we're in and not the one who's in the situation with us. Even through all that chaos, God is in it with us. You may not be able to see the image, but it's in there. You have to focus your eyes on what you're looking at. So the question is, what are you looking at? That's good. That's great. Are you focusing on the things that are going on around you? Mm -hmm. Are you focusing on the obstacles and the distractions? Are you looking at your past mistakes? Are you really just paying attention to the situations and not the one who's in the situation with you? I'm going to give a lot of Bible stories today. I am not going to read them all. Some of them will be up there, but I'm going to suggest that you write down what they are because I'm not going to read them. I'm going to summarize them because I would like to make it practical. The Bible, sometimes we don't put ourselves in a story. I'm going to really put ourselves in a story today, okay? So write down, and then I want you to go back at home, read the actual story for yourself. We're going to start out with Matthew 14, verses 22 through 31. And this is the story of Peter walking on water. Notice I said Peter, not Jesus. So let's start out. Basically, what's happening is Jesus says, hey, disciples, listen, y'all go on over there to the other side of the lake. I'll meet up with you later. He's like, all right, deuces, peace. Okay? Yeah, you didn't know he talked like that. He, he was straight hood. So, <laughs> so what happens is now he's going on the other side of the lake. Now, as they're going on the other side of the lake, about 4 o'clock in the morning, right, Jesus starts stro strolling up to the boat. Okay, he's strolling up to the boat, and the disciples are like, yo, 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 what's that, what's that? And they're freaking out. They're like, oh my gosh, no, no way, no way. Is that a ghost? And they're freaking out. And Jesus is like, chill, y'all, chill. It's me. Yeah, you never read Bible like this before. <laughs> so he's like, chill, it's me. And then Jesus, Peter... Peter, being the man he is, say, if it's you, tell me to come on out there. He said, come on in. So Peter gets out the boat, and he starts walking on the water because he's looking at Jesus, trying to make sure, is that really you? And he's walking because he's looking at Jesus. Is that really you? And he realizes, oh, that is my man Jesus. After he realizes my man Jesus, for some reason, he feels a splash of water on his leg. Oh, man, what was that? Then all of a sudden, he hears a crash of a wave over there. Oh, man, what was that? Then all of a sudden, something else got his attention. And he's starting to notice that he doesn't just hear what fill one splash of water, he's soaking wet. Now he's starting to hear all the waves going on around him because it's just getting crazy. And then he's starting to realize, oh my God, I'm in the middle of the ocean. Oh my gosh, I'm surrounded by a sea of nothingness with waves coming over me. Father, help me! And he begins to sink. All because he took his eyes off Jesus. He lost sight of where he was going, who he was going towards, and who told him to come. This is what we do in church every day, right? Let's just be real. 
you might hear a great message. I'm not saying it's this one. But you might hear a great message, right? And then you leave church all motivated. Man, that was so fire. I can't wait to do the stuff that I just learned. And I'm so excited for Jesus. Hallelujah. And you first, you know, you get out the church, you walk out the door. The first thing you do, we all do this. We turn on our cell phones and we check the text messages. And then we're like, oh, no, that person didn't just say that. Ooh, splash of water. Then we get to the car and someone said something to our kids, wife, spouse, somebody, or we're driving home and someone did something that made us mad. How dare you? Ooh, I heard a wave crash. What was that? Or maybe it's the next morning you go to work and then a coworker says something or did something or your boss gives you another project and, it's de- and he has a deadline due at the end of the day. And then all of a sudden, oh my gosh, what's all these waves and water going on around me? Father, help me, I'm sinking. But just two minutes ago, a day ago, an hour, a couple of hours ago, we were all about living our life for Jesus because our mind was there. But something happened in the midst of that that we lost our focus. The distractions of the world, they were going to come, but our eyes have to be fixed on Jesus. What are you looking at? I love another similar story. I'm going to give you stories out the wazoo today, okay? Another similar story is in Mark 4, uh, verse, chapter 4, verse 35 through 41. Jesus says, we're going to go to the other side. I'll, I'll summarize for you, shall we? Jesus just got finished doing a whole bunch of miracles, turning uh, bread, bread into and fish and expanding it so it could feed a multitude of people, okay? And then he said, look, disciples, hey, let's, we're going to go to the boat. And the other, we're going to go to the other side. So he, he gets in the boat this time with the disciples, and a whole bunch of other boats are following them. Now, I don't know about you, but if I'm going to perform a whole bunch of miracles, I get a little tired. That takes some energy out of me. So he goes downstairs and takes a nap. And it says that all of a sudden a great storm came, and then water started entering into the boat, and it's just getting to be too much water. Now, this is what I picture, right? I picture all the water going on the boat, and all the disciples are like, oh, my gosh, we're going to die. So they're taking buckets, right? And they're trying to get the water out the boat. Wouldn't you do that? Yeah. yeah, this is what we do. So then they're like, oh, my gosh, we're dying. So I'm thinking that they got mad. They go down and say, hey, yo, Jesus, what's up, man? Don't you care that we're going to die? Yeah. But I don't think they said that because they expected him to do something. I think they said that because they were mad that they're working so hard to stay alive and they wanted him to help pitch in and get the water out the boat. That would be me. Right? So now he gets up. What's wrong with you people, man? Didn't you just see what I did back there? Do you not believe? Hey, wind, water, waves, peace be still. Didn't I tell you we're going to the other side? Are you not holding on to the pole, which is the word of God, that I said we are going to the other side? Then why are you fearing? Happens to us again, right? We make a promise or to our kids or we say we're going to go somewhere, right? And then they really want us there. And I know this is my life, I'm telling you. So they really want us there. And then all of a sudden it rains. So the kid's like... Dad, are we still going to go? It's raining outside. I told you we're going to go. All of a sudden, I'm taking a nap. Hey, Dad, are we still going to go? I know you're tired. Didn't I tell you I'm going to go? All of a sudden, we hear there's an accident accident on 75. Hey, Dad, are we still going to go? I know there's an accident on 75. Hey, I said we're going to go. So if we're going to go, we are going to go. Didn't I tell you that? Didn't he say that? We're going to the other side. We have to keep our eyes on Jesus. We're going to do, he's going to do, and perform all the things that he said he would do. My question is, what are you looking at? If I'm being honest for me, it's not so much the things that are going on around around me that messes me up. Right. To be honest, if I'm being honest, when things are going on around me at that present time, that's when my focus is actually even more so on Jesus. That's that's me. That might not be everybody. That's me. That's when I learned to turn my body and my eyes on Jesus. God, what are you trying to say in this situation? But I'll tell you what hangs me up and I will venture to guess it hangs most of us up in here. The thing that hangs me up and keeps my eye off Jesus more is my past. Who I was, things I did 
where I would be if I didn't do those things. Oh, God, how can you forgive me for this? Those things that are in the past are the things that hang me up. So I'm going to tell you another story. I'm going to go a little bit deeper in this story, okay, because I want to make sure I paint this well. So this is the story of Sodom and Gomorrah and Lot. You're going to find the story. It's two chapters in verses Genesis 18, chapter Genesis chapter 18 through Genesis chapter 19, okay? Summary. First of all, you have to know that Lot is the nephew of Abraham. Everyone got that? Now, Abraham and Lot at some point really early, before I get to Sodom and Gomorrah, I want to tell you how he got there. Abraham and Lot, they, they, God was just blessing Abraham, and, and Lot was the beneficiary of being with Abraham. Abra Lot got blessed because he was with Abraham. Abraham grew in stature, Lot grew in stature. Abraham got much wealth, Lot got much wealth. Pretty soon, they were too large to stay together, and there was some t tension going on between the people that they had. So Abraham told his nephew, he said, listen, boy, I want you to look to north, south, east, and west, figure out where you want to go, okay? Wherever you go is fine with me, and I'll just go in a different direction, but we can't be having this, all this beefing going on between our peoples. Make sense? So Lot says, okay, he looks around, and he sees that spot over there. He goes, man, that looks good. I imagine it says it looks like it's flowing with milk and honey. He goes, the land looks prosperous. I'm going to go there. The land he chose was Sodom. Everyone got it? Now, now we're in Sodom. Fast forward. <laughs> we're in Sodom. Sodom now is a land filled with wickedness. I mean, things are going crazy up in Sodom. So God's like, hey, he goes, God goes to Abraham and says, Abraham, I'm about to destroy and bring judgment on Sodom. But I'm telling you because your homeboy Lot is up in there. Okay? Now, Abraham's like, he's pleading with God, actually bargaining with God. I love that part, by the way. I'm not going to get into the whole thing, but he's like, if you can find this many people, find this many. Finally, he finally got down to say, if I could just find one person safe, will you save the city? He's like, okay. But he couldn't find anyone safe. So he said, he said, well, save my nephew. So God sends angels down to Sodom. Okay? And he says, and these angels are like, Hey, Lot, we're about to destroy this place. All right, get your stuff. Let's go. Now, Lot was like, well, hold on a minute. I got family. In his house, he has a wife and some daughters, right? But he also has some extended family. So he goes out and says, hey, this kind of sounds like Noah, right? He goes out and says, hey, guys, God's about to bring judgment on this place. Come on, come on. We got to get out of here. We're going to flee. We're going to go off somewhere. We got to get out of here before the judgment comes. And you know what they do? They laugh. Ha, 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 silly person. Get out of here. Okay. So he goes back, there's no help. Now, I'm paraphrasing, summarizing. He goes back and there's a whole bunch of men at his door, okay? And they're like, yo, 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 I heard you got some male angels up in there. Tell them to come outside so we can talk to them and have some relations with them, right? This is what it says. He says, no, no, don't do this. First of all, this is crazy, I got three daughters. Take my daughters instead, right? You're like, no, no, no. So they start trying to push their way through. So the angels pull Lot inside the house and struck, strike them in a blindness. Now here's where it gets good. Now the angels start saying, now first of all, we know, he knows they're angels. We know they're angels. And the angels say to Lot, hey Lot, go to the mountains. Got it? He tells them where to go. Oh no, I can't go there. That's so far. Can I just go to the city right over there? I can see that city. It's right there. Can I go there instead? Right? Now, I want to point this out real quick. We got to remember that Lot is a beneficiary of Abraham's faith. When Lot, when Abraham told Lot to pick which way he wants to go, you would think that Lot would have saw how God had favor on Abraham's life, and he would have said, hey, God, you direct me and tell me which way you have me to go. Mm -hmm. right. He didn't do that. Even if he didn't have a relationship with God himself, you would think he would say, oh, God of Abraham, yeah. right. please tell me on which way you would have me to go. Because I know that you, his eyes are on you and you showed him favor. I want that same thing for me. Yeah. But he didn't do that. Mm -hmm. Guess what? He didn't do it here either. I can see that spot right there. Can I go there? Fast forward a little bit more. Fine. Angel, Angel's probably like, God, can I just blast this man? That's, probably, that's what I would be like. I don't have patience for all that. Right? Can I just blast? But he's like, fine. Go on, get. Go on, get. All right? So now, off and running. All right? He's going to that place. He goes, listen, don't you look back. 
There's nothing else here for you anymore. Don't look back. So they're off and they're running. Now, the Bible says that the skies open up with like lava pouring out of it. Fire and brimstone, big, big balls of fire like hell coming up. So you must know that you have to have heard the kabooms and the thrashing. You have to smell the sulfur and the smell of all the destruction going on. And, they, and so you're going down and you're going on. Man, I don't want to be both parts of that. I talk about cultural differences, how I always, I always tell people there's, there's differences. Someone sees something and y'all going to ask. Some people might ask, hey, what's going on? Most people that I know are going to be like, hey, what's going on? <laughs> Okay, so this is what's happening, right? We got those things going. But in the process of this whole thing, Lot's wife looks back. And the Bible says instantly she turns into a pillar of salt. I'm not going to get into the significance of what that means with a pillar of salt, but I am going to ask you a question. Why did she look back? I'll tell you why. She had family there. Those people that stayed there that didn't come. Those were her kids. She had memories there. She lived there for a long time. She had memories and, and home, not a house. She had a home, yeah. right? She had comfort zone. Everything and all that she knew was there. So though she's moving forward in obedience, she has a foot stayed in the past. Oh my gosh, and you can't continue to move like this. You can't move forward when you're still living in the past. You cannot, oh good, Jesus. Forgive me. <laughs> the only thing your past, the only thing you could change about your past, or the only thing that could change about your past, let me say that. The only thing that could change about your past, let me rephrase that again. The only thing the past can change is your future. The only thing the past could change is your future. Let me, let me explain what I mean. You could always look at the past and realize, hey, you know what? Learn from it. I don't want to do that again. All right. Or you can have testimonies from your past. Look at where God brought me from. That's great. But if you're trying to move forward and you're still anchored to the past, you're not going to go anywhere. It is impossible to move forward while you're living in the past. So what got you living in the past? What things are you looking back on that's not moving you forward anymore? What are you anchored to? Maybe it's people. Maybe it's family. Maybe it's an old job. Maybe it's a decision that you made that I know for myself, I made some crazy financial decisions. And I look back and I was like, man, if I didn't do that, you know where I would be right now? Or maybe if I would have finished my college degree and didn't waste all that money, you know where I would be right now? If I didn't, if I didn't, if I didn't. Or if I did, if I did, if I did, how is that stopping me from moving forward? What are you looking at? The Bible says in Luke 9, verse 62, no one putting their hand to the plow and looking back is fit for the service or the kingdom of God. What that means is once I made my, my decision to follow Christ, once I made my decision to keep my eyes fixed on Jesus, if I look back, I lose my saltiness. If I look back, oh, this thing just broke on me. That's okay. If I look back, I am not fit for the kingdom or the service of God because there's nothing about God that's moving back, looking back. He's always moving forward. Fix your eyes on Jesus, the author and finisher of your faith. One of my favorite song lyrics is by uh, Israel Houghton. I'm not moving back. I'm looking ahead. I'm here to declare to you that my past is over in you, Jesus. All things are made new. I have surrendered my life to Christ. I am moving forward. I'm not looking back. We are moving forward. Whatever guilt, whatever shame, whatever regret you have, whatever situation or circumstance that has got you bound up, tied up, caught up, stuck in the past, I want you to know that where it is, there it is. Jesus changes everything. 
You are no longer bound to the past. You are moving forward. You're going to pick that foot up and you're going to start putting it in front of the other one and you are not stuck there. Yes, you may be comfortable there, but we're not about being comfortable when we're in the kingdom of God. It says, consider this, it said. Consider those, the shame that he had to endure from people by being hung on the cross, but he did it with knowing that he's going to be sitting in the throne next to God. This is what we are to consider. Consider Jesus, keep your eyes on him, and don't worry about all that other stuff. We're not going back. What are you looking at? So good. Two more stories. <laughs> Story time. Don't go to nap, though. It's not nap time. All right. Book of Mark, chapter 5, verses 24 through 34. The woman with the issue of blood. This is how I picture the story. This woman basically had a health issue forever. I was going to say forever. And say, she sees Jesus over there, that Jesus takes, changes everything sign. She knows that Jesus changes everything, so she sees it. And she's thinking to myself, herself, if I could just touch him. Like, before he came to the town, everyone knew that he was coming to town. They heard of the miracles he was performing. So there was a crowd of people there to see him, to spectate, to understand who he was. And like, let me just see him. But she wanted to touch him. So this is what she did. She sees him. And she's like, oh, excuse me. I got to push through here. Oh, man, I, I, I can't make it. Let me, let me go around this way. Oh, man. Oh, wait, wait. Maybe I have to crawl through here. Oh, man. Uh, uh, let me step over here. Let me push this way through. If I can just, uh, she has to press in. She has to push. She has to fight. She has to persevere. And she could just uh, touch him. And it says instantly she was healed. She had to press through, push, endure, keep running, keep moving. Her whole time, she didn't see all the obstacles that were there. No, that's not true. She saw every obstacle and everything that got in her way. And she still, though, kept her focus on Jesus and figured out how to maneuver through those obstacles to get to the one who is there. Yeah, great. Now, hear me on this because you're about to get mad. Don't get mad at me. Is that not us today in church? Because at the end of the story, it says... The disciples were like, Jesus said, who touched me? The disciples were like, dude, were you crazy? All these people rubbing up against you, you're asking who touched you? Are we not here in church today? What do you mean, who touched you? What do you mean, what word are you getting? Well, well, I felt someone come here to me today to, to, to get the word, to have it planted in the heart, to make a change. They weren't just here because it's a Sunday. They weren't here because of something that they do. They came with the expectation that if they could get touched, they could be free. Yeah, it's good. They came here today not just because it's what we do, it's because it's who I am and who they are to come to me. Their eyes are fixed on me and they have an expectation to reach me so I could change everything in their lives. Why are you here today? Yeah. Who are you looking at? Yeah. <sighs> Jesus truly changes everything. Fix your eyes on Jesus. Peter walked on the water because his eyes were fixed on Jesus. Nothing else mattered. They got to the other side because Jesus said so. The eyes were fixed on Jesus. They stayed attention to his word. Nothing else mattered. The lady with the issue of her blood got healed because her eyes were fixed on Jesus and nothing else mattered. What are you looking at today? Let Jesus be your guide. Let Jesus be your focal point. Fix your eyes on Jesus. Focus in on him. It doesn't matter about the chaos and all the colors and the squeaky lines and the dots. What are you looking at today? I promise you this is my last story. Okay. Second Kings. Chapter 6. Verses 16 through 17. Summarize, paraphrase. The spirit of uh, Elisha, not Elijah, Elisha. Elisha has been causing ha havoc with the Armini uh, 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 Armenians, yeah, Amorites. Amorites, Armenians, whatever they are, okay. But he's causing havoc, okay? Now, in the process of causing havoc, they got tired of him. Like, hey, find out where he is. We're about to get him. We're about to be about about it. Someone said I didn't say that last week. Okay? We're going to go get him. So now, in that process, right, <laughs> they go and 
they're surrounding the city where Elisha and his servant is. Elisha and his servant wake up in the morning. The servant says to Elisha, Master, we're surrounded. What are we going to do? Look at these people. There's so many of them. <laughs> and Elisha says to his servant, there's more of us than there are of them. Now the servant's like, what the heck are you talking about? I see me, I see you, and I see them. Elisha prays the prayer, God, open his eyes so he may see what I see. Elisha's eyes were opened. And he sees in the hills legions of angels with chariots of fire waiting to come down and throttle the enemy. Now, just like that picture, if you could put that picture back up, the first one, right? Just like that picture, right? They're both in the same place. It's not that Elisha don't see the same surrounding that is happening, right? But his eyes, he sees the natural, but he also sees the supernatural because his eyes are focused on Jesus. We have to make that switch where our eyes are no longer focused on a situation and what we see naturally, but we gotta be able to see Jesus in every situation so that we can continue to walk and run down that path with the pole, plant that pole and be catapulted over obstacles because we know that our God is there. Yeah. What are you looking at today? As a close today, here's what I want to do. In our own life today, we know, we know, we got things coming at us, being thrown at us from every side. Rather, depending on the age of your kids, you got different things. Depending on the age of your parents, you got different things. Depending on the age of you, you got different things. And that's not even counting work. That's not even counting church. That's not even counting just having a house or not having a house or finding things, how to make me, you just have things being thrown at you. But even in the midst of all those things, you always have your past. What I want us to do today, in your, in your seats today, or next to you somewhere is an index card. I do not want you to put your name on this card, but here's what I want you to do. I want you to take some time and I want you to write down, and Justin, if you could get that thing for me, I want you to take some time, I want you to write down anything that you feel shameful of, anything that you have regret, anything that is keeping your foot here while you're trying to move there. I want you to write it down so that when we come up, and then we're gonna come up here, we're gonna stand over this ba basket, we're gonna rip that card up, and we're gonna put that card in a basket, and we're gonna be released from our past. We are no longer gonna have those things bound to us. Amen? Now, listen, you don't have to do this because we're going to dismiss you. You don't have to do this. I want to give this is going to be a symbolic thing, just like baptism is symbolic. But if you want to walk in freedom, if you want to have no longer be held to what ifs, why didn't I? I should have. If you want to be free, and I'll tell you what's going to be on my card. I'll tell you straight forward. Rejection things are going to be on my card. Things that I did or should have did financially. Things that someone said to me that I can't let go. Things that I said to somebody that I just feel horrible about, horrible about because of the person I am now. There's things that I have that I'm going to put on my card. I'm going to be specific in some areas. I'm going to be broad in general and in others. And it doesn't matter because no one's going to read the card. It's between me and God. And I'm going to rip that card up. I'm going to throw it up in there. And I'm going to walk away. And no longer that's going to be bound to me because I'm going to be free in Jesus' name because Jesus changes everything. I'm no longer looking back. I am looking ahead. I'm here to declare to you that my past is over in Jesus. All things are made new. I have surrendered my life to Christ and I am moving forward. Move forward with me. Father God, we just thank you for this opportunity, Lord God, today. We thank you for your word. We thank you for your freedom of your word. And we thank you, more importantly, most importantly, for your son, Jesus. For in him, we have freedom. In him, we have life. We have our being. We have all that we need. Even though things will come our way, Father, we thank you that if we keep our eyes focused on you, you will lead us through. Doesn't mean we won't have to endure. Doesn't mean we won't have to suffer. Just as Christ suffered. But we're going to run this race with perseverance, not giving up, 
fighting ahead, moving forward, because the prize, the reward at the end is you. We give you praise, we give you honor, and we give you glory. And I'm going to leave you with one last verse. Philippians 3.13. I am still not who I should be, but I am bringing all my energies to bear on this one thing. Forgetting the past and looking forward to what lies ahead, I strain to reach the end of the race and receive the prize, which is God calling, me, calling us up to heaven because of what Christ Jesus did for me. I'm continually moving forward.